Hey class, Nathan here. It may seem a bit strange making a discussion video before the actual lecture, but remember, you can always watch these at any time and at your own pace. I'd rather be ahead of schedule now so I can spend more time on chapters 2 and 3 as we approach the midterm. I notice that many students find those chapters particularly difficult, and it also appears the most on the midterm. Oh, and one last disclaimer. Although I may skip some sections for lack of time, it is ultimately Professor Liebeck's discretion regarding which material is important, so consult with him for the most accurate statement. Anywho, we begin in section 1.4 with a bit of review of the definitions of pressure, density, temperature, and flow velocity. Much of the equations in chapter 1 and 2 are created using first principles and are differential based, so it's important that we define these above concepts as they apply to a fluid point. For instance, pressure is our main unit of transmitting force in this course. It is the definition of lift and drag, and we normally are used to seeing it as average pressure, which is the average force divided by the average area. It is more correct, however, to define pressure as being the change in force divided by the change in area. And if we take the limit of this as area approaches zero, we get pressure at a infinitesimally small finite point. Now, the reason we do this is because in our differential analysis, often done in this course, we want to have the ability to define pressure at any given point on the flow, you know, upon some body. Density is similar, except it's mass over volume, or more correctly, change in mass over change in volume, and we take the limit of this as volume approaches zero we now are able to find density as it changes along a moving fluid. Temperature also varies along points in a similar fashion, but we don't worry about delta T too much in this course. If you have to worry about temperature, it'll be given as a constant. Change in temperature is more of a 112-135 affair. Now, let's go back to this illustration that I made. In chapter 2, you'll see a bunch of concepts introduced that rely on the idea of applying it to a very small fluid element which moves along with time. In fact, flow velocity is defined as the velocity of this very small fluid element as it moves along some path, in this case psi 1 or b in the book. This path is also called the streamline, which will be of great importance in a few weeks. This last fact is notable because the fact that this element moves along some path means it not only has a magnitude, but it also has a direction as well. It is a vector quantity, which will be of note in chapter 2. So far, we have pressure, which acts normal to some surface. Recall, however, in 130A, when you learned about boundary layers in viscous fluid. Consider this. We have two streamlines separated by some distance, which we'll call dy, and there are fluid elements moving along the streamlines. And let's say the bottom one has a velocity v, whereas the top one has a velocity of v plus dv. In other words, some sort of change in velocity. The difference in velocities along streamlines create what's known as shear stress. Like pressure, Shear stress also shares the same units of some force over an area. But whereas pressure acts normal to some surface or body, shear stress acts tangential. In this class, shear stress will be the basis behind skin friction drag. Let's go ahead and find a differential definition of shear stress in the same manner that we did pressure. So we'll say that tau is equal to delta force divided by delta area and I'll emphasize that this is force acting in a tangential direction with a small sub f. So we'll take the limit of this as the area approaches zero. 
And thus we get our differential definition of shear stress. In addition to our calculus-based definition, shear stress can also be defined as our viscosity coefficient mu times this term, which is the change in velocity over the change in y, or some height above the surface. As you can see, the higher the velocity gradient, the greater the shear stress will be. In this class, we use English engineering units, which is traditional in the fields of aerospace. If you get an industry job in the US, there is a good chance you'll have to use English units as well. So take this as a chance to get used to them. Let's first start off with rho, or density. In English units, this is in the form of slugs per cubic foot. At sea level, this is equal to 0 0.002378 slugs per cubic foot. If you were ever in any airplane projects, this number should be very familiar to you. Now, a common mistake that many students make is multiplying this English unit density with some gravitational acceleration. Do not do this. Use this number whenever density is called for. We usually specify the altitude density or we give you enough information to do a conversion to account for the change in density. In fact, on my browser, you may have noticed that I have bookmarked a table of atmospheric properties in US units. Here I have density, temperature, and standard pressure. In addition, I also have speed of sound. Tables like these will be very useful in 158 because a lot of the problems are more practical and will call upon information at certain altitudes. Additionally, in 159, you'll have to program many of these values into your code depending on what stage the aircraft is and, of course, what altitude you're designing for. Now, most of the coefficients for lift and drag, as well as most of the math done in this class, are based around feet per second. That being said, however, your velocities may often be given to you in miles per hour or nautical miles per hour. So it is a good idea to know how to convert between these and feet per second. So now we move on to really what is the meat of the course. In aerodynamics, we're concerned about forces such as lift and drag acting on a body, typically a wing, tail, or fuselage. These forces come only from two sources, pressure and shear stress. In fact, between P and tau, this is the only way that a fluid can influence a body. Remember that pressure acts normal to a surface, whereas shear stress acts tangent. And together, these two impart a distributed force over a given body. Now, recall in statics and MAE150 how we can summate distributed forces into a singular resultant force and a moment. Well, let's assume that we can put this resultant force somewhere on the body such that the moment is not required. In other words, this singular resultant force is equal to the distributed forces of our previous pressures and shear stresses. Just want to do a quick reminder that pressure and shear stress can occur on the upper and lower surfaces of the body as well. Anywho, also recall in 150 that we could decompose a given force onto some coordinate system. So let's go ahead and do that right now. Let's think of our chord line as the x-axis. And we can also think of a line perpendicular to that to be the y-axis. So we're going to go ahead and decompose our resultant force into an x and a y direction. And I'm going to go ahead and change colors. Let's make blue be what we now call the normal force. And I'll go ahead and use the red color now to represent what we're going to call an axial force. So now we can go ahead and define two new forces that act on our body. A normal force, which acts in the y direction, or 
perpendicular to the chord line and an axial force that acts tangential to the chord line. So just a quick summary, we've taken these pressures created by shear and pressure and we've summated it into a resultant force. We then take this resultant force and decompose it in the frame of our, our body or airfoil, specifically along its chord line, which we call the horizontal, and we've broken it up into a normal force and an axial force. So this system works pretty well if the x-axis or chord line happens to coincide with the free stream velocity, which we'll call the infinity. However, what happens if our airfoil happens to be at an alpha, or angle of attack, to the free stream? At this point, it makes more sense to break up our resultant force into coordinate systems based upon our, our free stream velocity. So let's go ahead and do that right now. So we'll go ahead and define a force that is perpendicular to our free stream velocity as our lift. And we can go ahead and define the force that is parallel to our free stream velocity as our drag. So now we've broken down our resultant force into two components based on the direction of the free stream velocity, lift and drag. And you'll notice that lift and drag are related to the normal and axial forces by the angle alpha. The last thing I should point out is that although the infinity is normally horizontal to the ground, it doesn't always have to be. Uh, an example of a time where your free stream velocity is not horizontal to the ground is if you are dealing with downwash. In other words, if it happens to be at a downward angle. In that case, lift would still be perpendicular to our free stream velocity and drag would also be parallel to our free stream velocity. So just make sure you note that lift and drag, although we normally draw them as horizontal and vertical, don't always have to be. They're really based on the direction of the free stream velocity, which can change depending on your flow condition. So once again, quick summary, we have pressures in the form of shear stress and pressure acting on a body, which we summated into a resultant force. This resultant force was then broken up based on the airfoil geometry around the chord line into normal and axial forces. Oftentimes, however, our airfoil is at an angle of attack with respect to the free stream velocity. In this case, it is more useful to break up the resultant force into lift and drag, once again, based on the geometry systems of our free stream velocity. Now, I mentioned before how normal and axial forces are related to lift and drag via alpha. This is useful because we can then come up with this geometric relation right here. It allows us to solve for lift and drag based on the normal and axial forces, and likewise, solve for normal and axial based on lift and drag. Now, at this stage, we should probably take a step back because we did skip a few steps. And the important one is, how exactly do you go from a distributed pressure and shear force into a resultant force to find lift and drag? So let's go ahead and define our coordinate system. Let's draw our body with the chord horizontal with respect to the x-axis. Let's draw some pressure and shear forces acting on the body. And let's draw some on the bottom surface as well. So our convention is as follows. Pressure is always taken with respect to the y-axis, and shear stress is always taken with respect to the x-axis. And all of our angles are taken clockwise. So if we go ahead and take a look at the bottom surface, our angles would be as follows. Additionally, pressure and shear forces will be denoted with a sub U for upper and a sub L for lower. We'll also break up our body into two surfaces. We'll call the upper surface S sub U and the lower surface S sub L.
And here we see this drawing reproduced in the book. So that is our angle convention. Remember though, we're trying to summate a distributed force, not just at specific points. This means we have to use an integral. Now at this point, it's worth noting that we're actually dealing with a 3D surface. Fortunately, it's a 3D surface with a unit length one. So we merely need to perform a surface integral rather than a line integral. Let's go ahead and define ds as a very, very small portion of the body surface, which happens to be the upper surface. Let's go ahead and add the pressure and our shear forces. We'll also go ahead and add our angles. Using geometry, we can say that the total normal force over this small part of ds is equal to our negative pressure from our upper surface times our area, in this case ds sub u, times cosine of our angle theta minus our shear stress for the upper surface times our area of the upper surface times sine theta. And similarly, for our axial forces, for our upper surface, we can see that it is equal to negative upper pressure times dSU times sine theta plus tau upper times dSU times cosine theta. So essentially what we did is we just l looked at this picture and all of the components of force pointing upwards, we added to our, our normal components. And all of the forces that pointed parallel to the cord, we added to our, our axial forces. And these negatives are just because of the, the theta convention. Now if we repeat these same steps except on pressure and shear forces on the bottom surface of our airfoil, we get this relation. Our normal forces for the lower surface is equal to our lower pressure times our dSL times cosine theta minus our shear stress for the lower surface times dS lower times sine theta and the same thing for our axial force for the lower surface is equal to our lower pressure times ds lower sine theta plus our tau lower minus ds lower cosine theta. Okay, so now we have two equations for normal and two equations for axial. In order to find the total normal force, that is for both upper and lower, we have to integrate the top surface and we have to integrate the bottom surface. And we add these together to find our total normal force for the entire airfoil. And lastly, our integral bounds are going to be basically the start and end of our chord line. It's gonna be from the leading edge to the trailing edge of our airfoil. In other words, our bounds are dictated by the chord. So integrating between leading edge and trailing edge. Leading edge and trailing edge. Similarly, if we do the same to our total axial force, we integrate the upper and lower surfaces and add them together, we get the total axial force for our wing, or airfoil, really. And lastly, it's worth noting that, again, we're dealing with a pseudo 3D object. So far, we've only figured out the force on a narrow cross-section of our airfoil. In order to find the total normal force for the entire wing, 
we multiply it by whatever unit length there is. So in order to note that we are only solving for the normal and axial forces for a narrow cross-section so far, we denote it with a, a prime. Again, to find the total force for the entire wing, we would just multiply it by some unit length. Um, of course, assuming that the rest of the wing has the same profile as what we've just solved for. If it differs, the integral becomes a bit more complicated. But don't worry too much about that for now. Just note that's why the book notates normal and axial forces for a cross-section with a prime. Now, we more often deal with lift and drag rather than resultant forces. And obviously, if you change lift and drag, especially at different magnitudes, the location of your center of pressure will change as well. How do you change lift and drag? Well, the most common way is to increase alpha. In fact, if you increase alpha of an airfoil, very typically your location of center of pressure actually shifts forward. Now, even though this is more of a 175 concept, I note it because technically at this point in time, you have enough information to mathematically prove why center of pressure typically moves forward for most airfoils as you increase alpha. Pretty interesting, right? But anyways, I suppose we'll go ahead and move on into how to actually solve for the location of center of pressure. Now, don't forget, I noted that in all of these scenarios, our airfoil is perfectly balanced, which means the moment at all of these three situations are equal. So let's go ahead and use our force balance skills to see if we can't write an expression for the location of the center of pressure. So I mentioned that all three of these scenarios have equal moments. So let's look at the moment for this scenario. It is the moment at the leading edge, and that's about it. The resultant force acts on the location that we're measuring the moment from, therefore it contributes nothing to the moment. So this is equal to this scenario, and here we have the moment at the quarter chord location, and we also have some force acting at a distance from the location that we're measuring. Now because the axial force runs through the location that we're measuring, it does not contribute to any moment, therefore we only have to worry about lift. So the moment caused by lift is equal to the distance which is the quarter chord distance, so one quarter times our chord length, times our lift, and don't forget, we're dealing with um, a cross section here, so we have to have our primes. And then it just so happens that our convention requires a negative sign in front of this expression. So that is the moment created by this scenario. And then lastly, we just have this one, the moment created is only due to lift acting at some distance xcp. So here we have negative xcp. Again, the negative is because of the convention. You can go ahead and refer to the book for more detail about that. Times our lift per cross-section span. So there we go. In order to solve for x of cp, all we really need is the lift and the moment at the quarter chord, or the lift, and the moment at the leading edge, which is why you often see an expression for x of cp as equal to the negative leading edge moment divided by the lift per cross-section area. Um, I'm not going to talk about Buckingham Pi. You're likely not going to see this in too much of this class. If you if you would like to know more about it, refer to your 130B notes for a refresher. Same thing for flow similarity, which is along similar veins to Buckingham Pi. In fact, the only new thing that I really want to cover is going to be static fluids. Because previously I mentioned that pressure and shear stress are the only ways, or the main ways that a fluid can impart force on a body. Well, there's kind of a last way 
except it doesn't require any velocity, unlike shear stress. So let's talk about fluid statics. Do you recall in 130A, and I believe this is a common midterm problem, where you had some sort of dam-like structure and you had a body of water and you had to solve for the force or pressure or something uh, at a certain point. Well, this is essentially the same idea, except like we've been doing the whole chapter, we have to break it down in terms of finite elements. So let's go ahead and draw our small fluid element. And let's go ahead and give it dimensions dx, dz, and dy. Uh, like lift and drag, let's go ahead and do a force balance. So this fluid has some density, and obviously it has some volume, so it must have some mass. Well, more accurately, it must have some weight, which is equal to its mass times some gravitational acceleration times its volume, which is dx, dy, and dz. So here we have the, the weight of the fluid. And what other forces does it experience? Well, it experiences a pressure from below. And since we're doing a force balance, we have to write that pressure in terms of a force. So we have some pressure from below times an area, because that's what a force is, a pressure times area. And our area on the bottom will be dx times dz. Okay, so that's two forces so far. But like the bottom pressure, we also have some sort of top pressure. So similarly, it's going to be our pressure times the area, which, because it's a cube, it's still dx times dz. The difference is, for our top element, we also have to deal with the fact that this fluid has some height, which means pressure must change from the bottom surface location to the top surface location. And this change can be found by writing the pressure gradient, which is change in pressure over change in y, times our actual y. So now we have our forces, and let's go ahead and summate the pressures together. In other words, find the net pressure. And simplifying this gives us our pressure gradient times dx dy dc. So here we have an expression for our net pressure. Now going back to our object, I keep emphasizing that this is fluid statics, which means that our net pressure must balance with our weight Otherwise, this cube would start to accelerate in some direction. So we can go ahead and equate our net pressure with our weight of the fluid, which I previously stated was equal to our density times a gravitational term times the volume of the fluid. And the negative conventions, in case you missed it, was because these two forces are pointing down and this force is pointing up. So simplifying our new equation right here gives us the change in pressure is equal to some gravitational acceleration times the density times dy, or the change in height. So this is a pretty important equation. It, it's basically the main equation behind all of hydrostatics. In fact, if we go ahead and integrate it, I mean, because it's a differential. That's what you do to differentials. We end up with pressure is equal to rho g h instead of y is equal to some constant. In other words, the pressure at any net point of the fluid is equal to the, I guess, static pressure of the fluid plus your elevation change. Well, one last thing that I do want to note is um, so far we've ignored pressure on the side faces. Uh, there are pressures on the side faces. Thing is, they're all the same height, and they all act opposite to one another. So they cancel out. We can ignore them. So anyways, we have two fundamental pressure equations, and from these two equations, you can basically solve almost any problem. So let us draw a cube, except we'll make a note that this cube is actually hollow. And like before, we'll give it dimensions 
Well, let's give it dimensions of L instead. I'll make the height dy as before, except I'll bound it by h2 and an h1. So, like before, we have some pressure on top, which I'll call p1, and some pressure below acting in the opposite direction, a p2. Let's go ahead and use our first differential equation to see if we can't uh, write an expression for this scenario. So dp, change in pressure, well that just becomes our lower pressure minus our top pressure. So this becomes equal to, and what's on the other side, we have a negative gravitational force times the density of the surrounding fluid times a dy. And since we kind of integrated the left side, we should do the same for the right side. And our integral bounds are h2 and h1. In order to get rid of that negative sign, what you can do is you can flip the bounds around h1 to h2 times gravitational acceleration density of the surrounding fluid times dy. Now, some of you might be thinking, if this cube is hollow, how can it have a weight? And you're correct. The cube is hollow, and it has some sort of net pressure on it. Since it has no weight, there must be some net force on this side of the equation to balance this change in pressure. And that's precisely what we're solving for. We're trying to solve for the buoyancy force created by putting or rather displacing fluid around some cube. So how do we go from pressure to force? Well, pressure times area is force. And what area are we referring to? The area of the top and bottom faces. So essentially, L squared on both sides. So this becomes some force that we're solving for. And let's go ahead and integrate this. Becomes... Gravitational force, density, times delta H, times area. Let's rewrite this in a more general form. So gravitational acceleration, density. Delta H is essentially some length, and we have L squared. Well, what's a length cubed? That's a volume. Our buoyancy force is equal to the weight of the displaced fluid. This is pretty important, because we've essentially stated that the buoyancy force is equal to gravitational acceleration times the density of the surrounding fluid times the volume of our body, the volume of this cube. This is also known as Archimedes' principle. And lastly, it's worth mentioning that because our right-hand term is positive, this direction points upwards. In other words, as you might expect, in this model, buoyancy is a lifting force. Usually, we don't consider buoyancy when dealing with aircraft. It only becomes relevant when the volume displaced is huge relative to kind of its plan form size, such as a blimp or a balloon. Or it's relevant when the fluid is very dense, such as water. Be careful that you don't neglect it if a problem is phrased in such a way that you have to consider not only lift and drag, but also a buoyant force as well. The last part of this chapter is basically a precursor into the various types of fluids. I'm only going to mention the types of fluids, in fact, the narrow types of fluids that we consider in this class. So let's see. In this class, we deal exclusively with continuum flow. In other words, the, the spacing and density, rather, of the molecules is considered great enough that it's a continuum flow rather than being very far apart and spaced out, um, such as space, for instance. Uh, in this class, we deal with inviscid flow. And this is possible because most of this class deals with the effects outside of the very small boundary layer, which essentially behaves more or less as an inviscid fluid. Further simplifying things, we deal with incompressible flow only in this class. This is because the fluid velocity that we explore is typically at a low enough Mach number. You'll have plenty of opportunities to deal with compressibility in MAE 135.
that means for 136, at least, we can skip over Mach number regimes and you don't have to worry about critical flow and shock. That actually does appear in 158, though, so don't get too complacent ignoring compressibility. But anywho, that's a pretty good stopping point for chapter 1. I don't want to overwhelm you too much with information. Anyways, if you'd like some clarification of any of the points I touched upon, please ask during lecture or discussion. Though it might be a bit prudent to wait till at least after the first lecture uh, to see if Professor Liebeck answered some of your questions already. That being said, this pretty much wraps up week one's discussion video, at least for my side of things. I hope you had a pleasant weekend, and I'll see you Monday night for our first lecture. Take care.